All right, everyone. Welcome to homework three. This is homework three. Homework three. Yes, I called it homework three. Wasn't sure. Uh, there we go. All right, trying to get it all figured out here. Homework three, here we go. All right, homework three. All right, homework three, here we go. So what we have here in question one is a complex fraction. Whoops. Complex. Here we go, complex fraction. But basically, you have a fraction over another fraction. And remember, fraction bars just mean division. So you have 25x over 2x minus 10 divided by 5 over 3x minus 15. And we know what to do when we divide fractions, right? We flip, we take the reciprocal of the divisor. We flip the second one, 2x minus 10, and we're going to multiply. 3x minus 15 over 5. All right. Well, we have to factor some things. Of course, the monomials we don't factor, but we need to factor the two binomials here. Remember, factoring is everything. When in doubt, factor. All right, so my numerator is 25x. My denominator factors, there's a GCF of 2 there, x minus 5, all right, and then in the numerator of the second fraction, we have a factor of 3, greatest common factor, that factors out to x minus 5, and that's going to be over that 5. Now we notice x minus 5 is cancel, and this 5 down here will leave us with a 1. We'll divide the 25 5 times. So we actually have 5x times 3, which is 15x, over, the only thing left in the denominator is 2. Isn't that exciting? Now they get a little more exciting when it's not just a fraction over a fraction, but we've got four fractions here. We've got two fractions in the numerator and two fractions in the denominator. The easiest way to do this, in my opinion, is to find the LCD of all the denominators. All right. Well, we got 49 in that first denominator. We've got 7x in the second denominator, but 7 is a factor of 49. So we, we do need that x in there, though. So we just multiply that x. Third denominator is a 49. 49 is in the LCD. Fourth denominator is an x. x is in the LCD. So we got the LCD there. That's your first step. Your second step is going to be multiply the LCD by every term. Yeah, just trying to get that nice every term. Here we go. So I'm just going to do it over here. So 49x. Maybe it thought I was going to do it over there. I can't write that small. All right, here we go. 49 x times this piece, 49 x times that piece, 49 x times this piece, and 49 x times that piece, each term. Now, if you need to, to remind yourself what fractions are all about, put the 49 x's over 1, because you're multiplying by a whole number. When we do that, in the first term, the 49's cancel, and you're left with 5x minus. Second term, the x is cancel, and 7 will divide 49 seven times. 7 times 5 is 35. That takes care of the numerator. Now, we do this, and it gets rid of fractions inside of fractions. You'll have just a nice normal fraction at the end of this. All right, third term, 
49s cancel and you have x times x, which we know is x squared. There's a minus between them. And that last term, the x's cancel and you just have 49. Now it'd be nice if we were done, but remember, look for GCFs and special factorings. We have 5x minus 35. Well, that's a 5 in common there. We can factor out. And that leaves with x minus 7. Denominator, right? I see x squared. I see a difference. Is 49 a perfect square? Yep, 49 is indeed a perfect square. So this factors into x plus 7. x minus 7. So once again, we can factor. We, I mean, we can cancel the x minus 7s. And we're left with 5 over x plus 7. Isn't this fun? I love this stuff. Alrighty, I did plug my iPad in, so you can see it growing its percentage up there. Oh, I want to rationalize the denominator. Now, in math, sometimes we rationalize denominators, sometimes we rationalize numerators. So it'll always tell us what we need to do until we get to the point where we know what to do ourselves. To rationalize the denominator, remember that square roots, if they don't, not pretty, square root of four is a real is rational because that's two. But square root of three is a bunch of decimals that do not repeat and do not terminate. So it and same thing for square root of five. These are irrational numbers. So to rationalize the denominator, we don't want an irrational number down there. Well, the easiest way is to multiply the denominator by the square root of five. That will give us square root of 5 times the square root of 5 is the square root of 25. And that will give us 5. So basically, it takes the 5 out of the rational, out of the radical for us by rationalizing. But remember, whatever you do in the denominator, you must also do in the numerator. So now we've got the square root of 3 times the square root of 5. Remember, when we multiply radicals, all we need is for the indexes or the roots to match. These are both square, root, square roots, so this is going to be the square root of 15. So we just move the square root of 15 over and we're finished. Notice, however, square root of 15 is an irrational number. 5 is rational. We cannot simplify irrational numbers with rational numbers. So we're done. Now, the great thing about this number 4 problem is that it's not a monomial, right? It's a binomial. We got a 7, that's the rational part, plus 3 times the square root of 2, and that's the irrational part, because that square root of 2 is not anything pretty. No perfect squares there. So again, they want us to rationalize that denominator. We're always going to simplify unless it tells us not to. So in our original problem up here, Question number three, we just had to multiply by the square root of five. And it, everything turned out pretty. But when you have a mon binomial, you're going to have to multiply by its conjugate. Remember conjugate? We talked about those earlier. In this case, seven minus three square roots of two. Remember what makes conjugates so special? When you foil them out or multiply them out, the middle term goes away. So you're only having to deal with the rational parts. The irrational part is going to go away. But again, remember, whatever you do in the denominator, you must do in the numerator to maintain our problem. Because if the numerator and denominator match, right, they can cancel and be 1. So all you're really doing is multiplying by 1. It just looks weird. Okay, well, the numerator is... I'm just going to leave the numerator alone at this point and just write it out like that without multiplying it out. I have an ideas, but anyways, usually sometimes that works better. All right, so the first part, right, 7 times 7 gives us 49 in our denominator. Second part would be a negative set of 7 times a negative 3 square roots of 2 and a positive square root 3 square roots of 2 times 7. Well, those are the same thing. One's negative, one's positive. Those go away. So all we need to look at then is 3 square roots of 2 
times negative 3 square root of 2, that's negative. 3 times 3 is 9. And remember the, the rationals when you multiply, irrationals when you multiply? You multiply the rational part and multiply the irrational part as long as their index matches. So that's square root of 4. Now let's see here. Trying not to run out of room. I think I got a little more room over here. All right, that's not a pretty thing. Over. Now, what's the square root of 4? It's 2, right? So we have 49 minus 9 times 2, which is 18. So that's going to be 3 times 7 minus 3 square roots of 2 over 49 minus 18 is 31. Okay. Well, that's not too bad. I left the 3 out in the numerator because sometimes that 3 will cancel with something in the denominator. This particular one did not. Remember, if you have any questions, post them in the discussion in D2L. All righty. Question number five. Homework three. All right. So now we're doing equations. This is an equation. because it has an equal sign. Expressions do not have an equal sign. Equations have equal signs. The first thing you want to do is you want to distribute everything, get everything multiplied and divided that you can get, and make sure you've just got an x term or a variable term, and it's uh, and a constant term. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is we are going to distribute the negative 3 to the negative 5x plus 4. So that gives us 15x minus 12. Now we still have minus x on that left-hand side. Eh, the sides are divided by that equal sign. You have the left side of the equal sign and the right side of the equal sign. All right, so this is your left side and that's your right side. We're going to distribute the 2 on the right-hand side, get 2x minus 2. Notice there's still a minus 2 hanging out here All right, that we have to make sure we put there. There's our x from there. Okay. Now we want to combine like terms. Always want to combine like terms whenever we can. Still staying, whoops, these really aren't x. These aren't equal signs. These are arrows. All right. So the next thing that's going to happen, 15x minus x. Remember there's 1 there, so that's 14x minus 12, and then we got 2x, and over here is the constants that are alike, so that's minus 4. Now we want to get rid of x's on one side. Basically we want to move, what we call move, the variables from one side to the other side, and all the constants from one side to the other side. Some people have a specific way of doing it every time. I try to do it so I don't have any negative variables. 14 is bigger than 2, so I want to move the 2x over. It's plus 2 right now, right? If there's no sign, we know it's plus. So we want to zero that out. So we want to take minus 2x and minus 2x. Remember, we want to keep equations balanced. So it's just like those fractions. Whatever you do the denominator, you have to do the numerator. Whatever you do to the right side of an equation, you do it to the left side of the equation. If you do it to the left side of the equation, you got to do it to the right side of the equation. Got to keep it balanced. All right, here we go. So that's going to give us 12x minus 12 equals, these go to 0, minus 4. So now I've got 12x minus 12. I want to get the x term by itself, so I've got minus 12. I'm going to do the opposite to zero it out. And that leaves me with 12x, this zeroes out, equals 8. Because negative 4 plus 12 is 8. Now remember when you have uh, numbers and letters beside each other, it's multiplication. So you want to undo that multiplication. You want a 1x by itself. Well, if you get 1, you got to divide by 12, right? 12 divided by 12 is 1x. So you have 1x. But if you do the left, you got to do the right. Get 8 twelfths, but you can simplify 8 twelfths. Remember, it's always simplify as much as possible. 
So four will divide both of those two thirds. X equals two thirds. Now you can check this by putting two thirds everywhere you've got X in here and see if that thing equals on both sides. I'll leave that for you. Solve for you. Now there's two ways to do this. You can deal with this in question number six. You can deal with this with all those denominators and all those fractions, but if you find the least common denominator, we have five and two, we know that's 10, right? If you find that least common denominator, uh, that's your first step. Second step is to multiply the LCD by each term, just like we did with those complex fractions. All right, so 10 by each term, so here we go. Negative 5 u is going to get multiplied by 10. The 3 fifths is going to get multiplied by 10. 5 halves u is going to get multiplied by 10. And the 7 halves is going to get multiplied by 10. Now remember, if you need to, put it over 1 so you don't forget your multiplying fractions. Well, those are, those are whole numbers. That doesn't matter. Yeah. All right, so in the first piece, 10 times 5, negative 5u is a negative 50u. All right. And then here, 5 will divide 10 two times. And that gives us a minus 6 equals. Don't lose that equal sign in there. Third piece, 2 divides 10 five times. 5 times 5 is 25. And there's a u attached to that. Minus, there's a minus sign in there. And that last term, 2 divides 10 5 times, 5 times 7 is 35. So here you have the same thing you had before. Oh, me. We're having fun, aren't we? I really don't like that leading negative on that 50. So this time, we're going to go down here. All right. I'm going to add the 50. I'm going to add 50 U to this side, and I'm going to add 50 U. All right. That's going to then zero those out, and I'm going to get a minus 6 equals. I've got a 75 U minus 35. I want to keep the U over here by itself, so I want to add the 35 to zero out that. That's going to zero out, and that's going to be 20. 29 is what I want to say. Is that right? Y'all check that. Bring down your 75U. Remember, that's multiplication, so we want a 1U over here. So to get 1, we got to divide by 75. 29 is prime last time I checked. This hope it really is 29. <laughs> So 29 75th is U. Right. All right, I'm just going to put number seven here. So it's going to be on this side, all right? <laughs> For each equation, we want to choose the statement that best describes the solution. And if applicable, we give the solution. So basically, what happens is, if you come up at the end, and you have like, 6 equals 5, that's false, so there's no solution. Okay. Or you might come up with something that says 6 equals 6, that's true. And the solution then is all real numbers. Otherwise, you're going to solve it like we've been solving and get an answer. Okay, so for the first piece here, running out of room here, so I'm trying to squeeze all this in. Distribute the three and distribute the five, okay? So we got three X plus three plus two X equals, tell you what, scoot that over just a little bit. We're gonna do it here. All right, so that's going to be 3x plus 3 plus the 2x on the left-hand side 
is going to equal 5x minus 5 plus 5 on the right-hand side. So when you combine like terms, we have 5x plus 3. And over here, we have 5x, because minus 5 and plus 5 go away. All right, hopefully you can see this already, that the left side does not match the right side. We can subtract the 5x from over here and subtract it from over here. And when we do that, it goes away on the right-hand side and leaves us 0. It also goes away on the left-hand side and leaves us 3. 3 equals 0? Well, that's false, right? That's false, so there's no solution. No solution is our answer. All right, let's, so, so let's try this one. Again, we're going to distribute first. So we get 4v minus 8 minus the 3v equals 2v minus 12. All right. Combine like terms, that's going to give us v minus 8 equals 2v minus 12. Being who I am, I do not like to have a negative, so I'm going to subtract the v from this side. That'll go away, leave me minus 8 equals v minus 12. I'm going to add the 12 to zero that out, get that v by itself, and 12 minus 8 is 4. So this time we actually had a solution. V is 4. I'm going to draw this red line here. So here we go. That was that problem all the way up here. Okay. Now these get to be really fun because you've got a bunch of variables and you are solving for a variable with a bunch of variables inside. But if you understand the concept of solving equations, it doesn't matter if it's all variables or if it's all numbers and variables. They're telling us to solve for h. Now being the person I am, I actually like to put a circle around the variable I'm solving for. Because that means to me that g and k and f are just numbers. Now I've got a fraction. So I'm going to find that LCD, basically, or you can say you multiply by the reciprocal, which is what you do. Multiply both sides by 3, and we get 3F on the left. When you multiply it by 3 on the right, the one third goes away, and you're left with G plus H minus K. Now again, I want to remember that I'm solving for H. I'm solving for H. So I can subtract the g from both sides to zero it out over here. And that gives me 3f minus g equals h minus k. Now I remind myself that I'm solving for h. So I'm going to add the k to zero it out over here and add the k over here. There's no like terms, right? So we're just adding all these letters together. If we knew what they were, we could use it, but we don't. So we finally find out that H equals 3F minus G plus K. Isn't that exciting? Yay, exciting, exciting, exciting. Woohoo! I love this stuff. I wish you could see me in a classroom. I jump around and everything else. Kind of hard to do that on this video. All right. Yes, I know I could have turned it on so you could see me too, but there's no use to see me, and I'm not doing anything. I'm just sitting here writing on this paper. All right. Question number 9 and 10 and 11 and 12 and 13 and 14 and 15. Oh, word problems. Yay. All right. So we got this. Word problems are wonderfully precious. The key is to read. And then just kind of start using both sides of your brain. All right? When you're reading something, it's usually a story. So it's kind of fun to enjoy the story. Um, if not enough information is given, maybe think up a new story. And then go back to the math. Especially if you like to write stories and things. Or plays or do anything artistic. All right, so we have a total of total. 
288 tickets. They were sold for the school play. They were either adult tickets or student tickets. The number of student tickets sold was two times the number of adult tickets. Two times, that's twice, right? So we could say student tickets equals two times the adult tickets. How many adult tickets were sold? So they're asking us about the adult tickets. Well, we got to do something with that 288, right? 288 was the total tickets. 288 was the total tickets. So that means the students plus the adults equaled 288. All right, and I'm going to say <laughs> C below here. All right. So now we know what S is. S can be put in for S. S is 2A plus the adults equals 288. Remember, we want to know how many adult tickets. That's what they're asking us. So this is, let's go this way. This is 3A equals 288. Well, that's three times A, right? We want to get 1A, so divide by three to get one. And that leaves us with the adult tickets that were sold. 288 divided by three. I don't have a calculator sitting here with me, so I'm doing all this in my head. So that's 96 adult tickets. Tickets. Well, adult tickets. All right. I'd circle this if it would let me. Okay, there we go. Again, post questions in the discussion. I think I've answered some of these, but anyways, I will answer more. I like doing problems. I like doing math. All right. Now we got the traditional phone company question. Number 10. Customers of a phone company can choose between two service plans for long distance calls. Okay, so we got two plans. The first plan has a 16 month monthly fee and, that's a plus sign, charges an additional 14 cents for each minute of calls. Let's just stop there a minute. So the first plan, we could say the first plan has a $16 a month fee plus 14 cent for each minute of calls. You want to call that M for minute of calls? That's the first plan. All right. Let's look at the second sentence. The second plan has a $28 monthly fee and that's plus charges nine cent for each minute of calls. So we can say the second plan has $28 a month plus nine cent per minute. Alrighty. So now what's the question? Usually the last sentence is the question. For how many minutes? So we're looking for minutes, which is good because that's our M, right? How many minutes of calls will the costs of the two plans be equal? So we want to find out when does F equal first plan equal to second plan? Set them equally to each other. So those 16 plus 0 0.14 M, when does that equal? 28 plus 0 0.09 M. <coughs> I had to cough there. I hope you didn't hear that. I hope that wasn't too bad. All right, I tried to cover the mic. And here's something exciting. I kind of want to show you, okay? I'll do it in red because that's usually something I'm doing special. 0.14 is bigger than 0.9, so I definitely want to subtract the 0.09 M and bring it over here. But you don't have to do this in two steps. You can now, when you know you're moving your M's, that's going to go away, right? You're moving your M's to the left. That means you're taking your constant over here. Now, if I get some negative minutes at the end, I'll know I messed up somewhere on a sign. 
Anyways, that goes away. So 14 minus 9 is 5. So 0 0.05 M. And then 28 minus 16 is 12, I think. Ooh. And then, if I had a nice calculator I could look at right now, it'd be awesome. M equals 12 divided by 0 0.05. Let's see if I can do this. There's not a calculator on here, is there? Just remember, there's not a calculator on the... Ah! What happened? Oh, it just jumped. We're okay. It just jumped. All right, so 12 divided by 0 0.05, I think is 600. No, that's not right. 24, 240? Oh. 240? Yeah, that's it. So they're equal at 240 minutes. You can check the math. We can check the answer, right? 10's down here. 10, yep, 240 minutes. All right. All right, next one. Question number 11. Jane, Carlos, and Dale have a total of $109 in their wallet. Carlos has six less than Jane. Dale has three times what Jane has. How much does each have? You know, I really don't care. But hey, maybe one of them wants us to figure this out. And because we're mathematicians, they're going to give us the ability and pay us. So we got Jane, Carlos, and Dale. Let's really just do this. Jane plus Carlos plus Dale have a total of $109. It's a nine. That's a comma. Carlos has, have you noticed that whenever you see a verb that's usually an equal sign? Carlos has six less than Jane. So that's six less take away from Jane, right? Dale has three times what Jane has. That's three times Jane, three J. How much does each have? So we got to figure out everybody's. Well, we know that Carlos, so Jane plus Carlos, we know Carlos is Jane minus six plus Dale. But we know Dale is 3 times Jane, and that's going to equal 109. Then we just combine like terms. We have 5 J's minus 6 equals 109. <sighs> 109. Oh, we're adding six. That's good. Add six to both sides, right? Because you do the opposite, so you can zero it out. 5J equals 115. Divide by five, and Jane is going to have 23, I believe. Check the math there. So that gives us Jane's. Now we take what we know we have for Jane and plug it into Carlos and plug it into Dale. So Carlos will have 23 minus 6, 17, and Dale will have 3 times 23, which is 69. Now you can do a quick addition. All three of these together are supposed to have 109, 17 plus 23 plus 69. Is that 109? Yes, indeed it is. You can check that out. But you can check yourself and make sure your answers in a word problem make sense. Okay? One, we don't want any negative money. Nobody has negative money. We don't even know what negative money looks like. Unless you're in the stock market. Sometimes you can have negative money. All right. Question number 12. Yay, we're having fun. All right. Question number 12. Tech Wiz Electronics makes a profit 
of $35 for each MP3 player sold and $18 for each DVD player sold. Okay. Last week, TechWiz sold a combined total of 123 MP3 players and DVD players. They want us to let X be the number of MP3 players, all right, that TechWiz sold last week. They just want us to write an expression for the combined total profit in dollars that TechWiz made from the MP3s and the DVD players last week. We don't have to solve this. We just have to write the expression. So from the first part here, we're told that they made a profit of $35 for each MB, MP3 player. I'm just going to put an M. And $18 for each DVD player. I'm going to put a D. In a minute, I'll switch it to do what they said over here. But right now, I want to do M's and D's. So I understand what's happening. From the second sentence, we learned that they had a combined total of 123. So that was M plus D equals 120. But they only want us to write the expression for the total profit in MP3s, which they're calling X. Well, we can take this. Profit was the P. And we can take until we can subtract the D from both sides. And we can get M equals 120 minus D. Nope, didn't want to do that. I did that backwards. No, no, what I do? Oh no! Ah, back buttons. Oh, so happy for back buttons. Okay. All right. So, yeah, that's what I want to do. I did that right. Because they want the expression MP3. So you want everything as an M? No. So I got it backwards. If you get it backwards, just stop. Back up. Erase, work again. DVDs equal 120 minus the MP3s. So now what we got to do is put that in for D. And we know that our profit is going to be 35M times MP3 players plus 18 times 120 minus the MP3 players. But they don't want us to use M, M, they want us to use X. So make sure we change that to 35X. Make sure it's a lowercase x. And you can just write the expression out. And they're happy right there. If you want to simplify further, it'll take it. But don't worry, it's done. Alrighty. A lot of times that's what you're going to be doing. You're going to get two expressions and you're going to you know, three in this number 11, right? We had three um, equations and we just substituted them in to the big main equation. And that's what we do a lot of times. So keep looking for those kind of things. All right, question 13. We have two trains that leave the station at the same time. One heads east and the other heads west. The eastbound train travels at 85 miles per hour. The westbound train travels at 75 miles per hour. How long will it take for the two trains to be 416 miles apart? Do not do any rounding. Alrighty. Two trains leave the state. These are fun. Once you get the hang of them, it's great. Word problems stretch your brain. I was, you know, I was working in a tutoring center. There was a lady there named Elsie Vaughn. And she was the word problem guru. Students came in with word problems. Every single one of us who worked there just sent them to Elsie. Well, I'll tell you one thing. One night, it was a slow night. There wasn't anybody in there but Miss Elsie and me. I grabbed the College of Algebra textbook. That's back when we actually used textbooks. Set it down and said, I've got to learn word problems if I'm going to be doing this. We worked five hours that night, and for all five hours, all we did was word problems until finally it clicked. 
So if you're not getting the word problems right off, it's okay. You just got to keep practicing, 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 practicing. We had no place to go, so we stayed there for five hours straight. I don't know that I would have learned them if I had not sat on them for five hours straight, going over and over and over how to do them. So here we go. We got two trains leaving the station. All right. So somewhere back there, you may have learned that distance equals rate times time. And with this, I make a chart. I don't know any other way to do this. Five hours with Miss Elsie Vaughn. And I make charts. We have a train going eastbound. Yeah, I know. Thinking of a song there. And we have a train going westbound. And sometimes we have a total line. Sometimes we need it, sometimes we don't. But that's usually what I'd like to make my charts to look like. All right. The eastbound train is traveling at 85 miles per hour. So that's a rate, 85 miles per hour. The westbound train is traveling at 75 miles per hour. So that's another rate, 75 miles per hour. How long will it take for the two trains to be 416 miles apart? Well, 416 miles apart, that's the total distance. How long means we're looking for time. Now, the trick here is realizing they left the station at the same time. So the time they're traveling, I'm going to call it X, is going to be the same. One's going to go further, farther. Anyways, one's going to go much more distance than the other one because one's going faster. But it's going to be the same amount of time to get them 416 miles apart. So we remember that distance is rate times time. So this one's going to be 85x. And eastbound and the westbound is going to be 75x. So the distance that each one of those travel together, the sum will be 416. So you have your formula 85x plus 75x equals 416. 85 and 75 is 160. X equals 416. Pardon me while I grab my calculator. That one's not going to happen in my head. Although I think it's somewhere around 3, but I'm not sure. Do not do any rounding. Well, that's nice. I hate it when it tells me that, because that looks like that needs rounded. Oh, wrong button. Hold on. Find my calculator. Are you grabbing your calculator? 416. Can you beat me to it? 416 divided by 160. Did I add right? 2.6. So we didn't need to round because it was a 2.6 exact. So it is 2.6 hours. That's how long it takes for the two trains to go apart. If you wanted to find out how far each train went, just substitute the 2.6 back in for the X for each different train. We are having fun. We're almost finished with homework three here. Now, for me, question 14 is just a question to keep us busy. It does have a helpful and the fact that we learned to substitute back in and all that. So that's what it's used for. And most people know their geometry formulas. So we should know our geometry formulas. The length of a rectangle. So hopefully you remember what a rectangle looks like, right? OK. So the length of the rectangle is, remember that's our equal sign, four longer. So it's four more than the width. All right, that's first sentence. Second sentence says the perimeter is 40 inches. Find the area. Well, last time I checked, the perimeter formula was P equals 2L plus 2W, right? Two times the length plus two times the width. 
But we're told in the first sentence that the length is the width plus four. Distribute the two. 2w plus 8 plus 2w. Oh, wait, don't we know what the perimeter is? Right, they told us, right? The perimeter is 40. We can put that 40 in there, and we have an equation we can actually work with. It's got numbers. So that's 4. That's 40 equals 4w plus 8. Uh, I got to go up here. So subtract 8 from both sides, you get 32 equals 4w. Divide by 4, w equals 8. With the w is 8, we know the length, right? The length is up here. It's the w plus 4, so that's 12. We want to find the area. We know that area equals length times width. So this is 8 times 12. 96. We found the area. So these aren't too bad. Again, it's going to be some sort of substitution, two types of equations. And they don't give you that second equation. you got to remember that. Perimeter is 2L plus 2W. And you need to remember your area of a rectangle is length times width. All right, last question for homework three. Brian deposits $5,000 into an account that pays simple interest at a rate of 4% per year. How much interest will he be paid in the first four years? Okay, so we got simple interest. So we know that's I equals PRT. I means interest. P is principal or the money you put in the bank or even the money you borrow. R is your rate as a decimal. T is time in years. So the interest, putting 5,000 in, and that's our rate, that's our P, and that's our T. All right, but rate is a decimal, 0 0.04 times four years. Let me grab that calculator again over here. And that's 5,000 times 0 0.04 times four is 800 and you can check my math see if that's done right or well, we can check the answer at the bottom down here it is 800 all right if you notice any discrepancies between their answers and mine please let us know in the discussion and d2l all right so homework three is done we are turning off the presentation and stopping the recording stopping the recording there it is